churches who are represented today here. So when your church is mentioned, if you could just raise your hand. St. Sebastian Episcopal. Yeah! Grace Lutheran. Holy Name of Jesus. ORA Fellowship. Trudged up to the mall and uh, opened the doors, went. 
and in the mall, of course, we park in the barn the open the doors at night. Oh, so, <coughs> picture this. Nine o'clock, Dillard's doors open. <laughs> and that's where the marathon began. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, I tell you, we went to every department in Dillard's. <laughs> then we went to every department in Penny's. Then we trudged down the full length of the mall and went through every department in Macy's. Too long, too short, too tight, and no sleeves. So, back in the car, after we trudged all the way to the end of the mall, or the parking lot, we get in the car, we go to Old Melbourne. We go to David's Bridal, Isabella's, and the Causeway. Well, there, too low. You know, this is a church event. <laughs> too shiny, too many layers, too much like a tent. So Claire pulls me back into the car. This time we're heading up 95 to Vieira. <laughs> All the way to Vieira. And there we went to Colt, to Chico's, to Coldwater Creek, to Charming Charlie's. I mean, ladies, it was to be dazzled, too many colors. Too much accessory, too frou frou, and too bizarre. <laughs> I tell you, I had to say no to <clears throat> fur jackets, to iridescent blouses. I had to say no to get one of this. Four inch earrings. <laughs> what was she thinking? And I also had to say no to pearl-studded moccasins and a full-length macrame coat. <laughs> oh, what are these young girls thinking of? It was just bizarre. So this, by this time, it was about 4.30, and we still hadn't eaten lunch. And I am fainting from lack of food and overstress. And I thought, we, we have got to sit down and eat. So Claire looked at me and as I'm hugging on her, Claire, food, food. And I think she finally recognized, oh, my mother isn't a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so she <clears throat> thought she better take care of me and she took me to Panera. So we're sitting there. I thought, this is a good opportunity to tell Claire what I'm really looking for. <laughs> so she's munching away and I say, Claire, dear, I know you want me to be fashionable, modern, at your special event. But I have to tell you, I've got to wear something that reflects who I am. And she looked at me and she says, well, Mother, don't you know who you are? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Claire, I know I'm your mother, but um, I'm also a child of a holy God. And I want to honor God with my life. Not just what's with the, what is on the inside, <coughs> my spiritual life, but with, with what is on the outside, the side the world sees. So I need to have an outfit, a dress that is tasteful and modest. It has to be the right fit. And so far, we haven't found it. <laughs> well, she looked at me very serious grab my hand and yank me across the parking lot again. And whoa, we were into another store. <laughs> it was amazing. Well, <clears throat> about quarter to eight, we pulled into the driveway. <laughs> but we came this time with packages under our arms. We had picked out a simple, tasteful outfit that both mother and daughter had agreed was the right fit or any mother of the bride. I wonder if Starbucks delivers. Let's <laughs> <laughs> pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for being the right fit for us in every aspect. There is not one thing we can come to you with, uh, complain about, or ask help for that you don't know the right answer. And that you are not willing, because you are always willing to help us. We just thank you, Lord, and we ask you to open our hearts and open our minds as Pat brings your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Carol Burnett. <laughs>
this uh, Sunday night on the History Channel. Have you heard? Yes. Begins the series, a weekly, monthly, this monthly of March series on the Bible. The story unfolds. You remember uh, Roma Downey from uh, Touch My Angel? Very instrumental on this. You might have the time that it starts. It's hot. Okay, great. You want to you want to be a great a great review for our, our lessons that we've been processing and going through the Bible. As we've been studying down through history, we have seen how God's plan has been unfolding. As we studied the life of Christ, we started last week and we advanced now through the Gospels. The most convincing proof of Jesus' outright claim to be God was his own resurrection. The 40 days that followed were filled with many appearances and encounters with their living Christ. Now on the 40th day, Jesus took his disciples to a mountain in Jerusalem and he gave his final sermonette. Then he ascended into heaven. In Matthew 28, this is what he said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of his Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. A little bit more details are given in the book of Acts, the history of the early church. It says that when Jesus was taken up before their very eyes on that day, a cloud hid him from their sight, and as they stared up into the sky, then a pair of angels appeared and told them this, This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, he will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. From here on out, the rest of the New Testament explains and makes sense of all that transpired here. From Acts to Revelation. The book of Acts is an historical record of the early church, followed by the epistles. They reflect the life of the early Christians and the organized church. And then it concludes with the book of Revelation, a vision of what happens before and during and after the second return of Christ to the earth. This final mandate here that Jesus gave is called the Great Commission. It means to co-labor or co-partner with God in carrying on the work of the kingdom that he had established. This mandate put the go in gospel, it put the each in reach, it put the each in teach, and the disciples mobilized with a mission. It required on their part initiative, hard work, energy, and creativity. Many political and religious movements unravel when their leaders, they die. However, Jesus promised he would send another leader, his Holy Spirit. 120 believers gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem. They tarried until the Holy Spirit came upon them. Just as Jesus had promised, go tarry, I'll send a helper. And they were empowered, and the once timid disciples began to stand strong and preach with boldness and pray for miraculous healings. The disciples turned the world upside down. It was a rapidly growing movement with thousands needing to be discipled. By God's design, he ordained the institution of the church. Peter established churches in Jerusalem, and Paul was the central figure in missionary efforts. Paul was the one who, throughout the Gentile world, he spread the gospel beyond the Jewish world. It's enlightening to read through the book of Acts that there were a number of women who played a significant role in the growth of the early church. If you read at the end of the book of Romans, Paul recognizes eight women and he um, writes that they diligently labored in his kingdom work. He recognized these eight women as hard workers in the kingdom work. Recently on the front cover of Christianity Today, this issue 
is the stories about 50 women of our day who are impacting our culture and our church world. Women impacting the kingdom of God. Now, in the New Testament, the concept of church was not a building. Well, that didn't happen around to the 3rd century when, uh, what was his name, Constantine, he became the leader, ruler. But up to, to then, the Greek term used for their understanding in the New Testament of the church is called ecclesia. It always referred to not a building, but at an assembly of people or a gathering of people. You see, all those multitudes that were converted began to then gather from town to town. They had cell groups. They met in homes. They were the talk of the town. Can you imagine them saying, hey, there's an iglesia in our neighborhood. <laughs> there goes those ladies again with their covered dishes. <laughs> Where two or three are gathered, this neighbor's always food, right? <laughs> And so they would all gather, and, and they'd fellowship, and they'd worship, and they were knit together. You see, this morning, we had a roll call of the local assemblies, okay? We see it in this community, right? Now, the term ecclesia also meant, collectively, you are the body of Christ. Isn't that right? We are a gathering together of a community of believers from maybe local assemblies here, and then we are also collectively called the body of Christ. Why is it called the body of Christ here? Because we are the embodiment of the visible body of Christ. We are his hands and his feet, and we are the voice in the world. This is our identity. This is what unifies us as a community of believers. And love for Christ is the tie that binds us together. Christ is our head. He rules over us. He cares for us. He sanctifies us through his cleansing word. And through the inward work of the Holy Spirit, he makes us pure and he makes us holy. This is how our unity comes about. And another term in the New Testament, especially in Revelation, you'll find next week, is the term for the concept of the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. Individually, you are a bride of Christ. Collectively, we are the bride of Christ. We are his special bride. Next week, as I bring the series to close from the book of Revelation, we're going to gather at the chapel. And when you enter the east door at 940... <laughs> now, let me get this right. We don't want everybody in here at 940, do we? We can't get them all in at 940. But beginning at 940, we want you to enter and we want you to feel like a bride as if you are entering the bridal chamber. Okay? As we then prepare our hearts through the ministry of that hour in preparation for the groom's soon arrival. Okay? I'm anticipating next week. Are you? Yes. All right. So the church of God, by his design, is both beautiful and it's functional, isn't it? The church has a mission to fulfill the great commission, to go and to reach and to teach them to obey everything <laughs> Jesus had commanded them. And Satan has a pattern to always try to stop this work but Jesus told Peter over 2,000 years ago that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Can you say amen? amen. So let's look at a, an early New Testament church where Satan had come and knock. Okay? There in your handout, I take you to the book of Titus. Just a portion of a letter that Paul, Apostle Paul, sent to Pastor Titus. And it's only three chapters long, so we have the middle chapter that we're going to examine this morning. Now, how does Titus fit into the New Testament and the whole kingdom of God and the work of that time? You see, Titus traveled and he worked with Paul in the missionary efforts. Paul was his spiritual coach. Titus was like the second generation of Christians of that time. 
Titus labored with Paul in evangelizing the island of Crete off the coast of Greece. They established many small assemblies there. All right? And so Paul, the missionary, had to move on. And as we can glean from chapter 1, if you read the whole book this week, it would be good. Titus was appointed to remain and to straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint leaders in the organization of this work and to help nurture the infant churches up in the faith. And of all places for young Titus to begin his pastoral experience, it was in Crete. No other society had a worse reputation. And you'll see in chapter 1 they were characterized as liars and evil brutes and lazy gluttons. It was a moral wasteland. But however, there were many converts there. And there were challenges then as those new converts came into the fellowships. There were many hypocrites up to no good. And you'll see it described in chapter 1 verse 15 that he describes that their minds and their consciences are corrupted and they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. Up to no good, circulating the, the houses from house to house, teaching things they ought not to teach. It's interesting that I heard on the news of some of the Fox News reported that in the past five years they have found through surveys that there has been a decline in church affiliation. Mm -hmm. They cited three main reasons that they uh, gathered from the respondents. Why the disconnect with the organized church? Number one, hypocrites in the church. Number two, scandals in the church world. Turn on the TV. And number three, this is a new one of our time. I belong to the new religion called spirituality. Spiritualism. It teaches. It doesn't matter about the organized church. It, it teaches just love God and love others. Isn't that right? Well, that is half right. Yeah. There's a half truth in that. You've got to love God. But wait a minute. Do you love his word? You know, do you want to please the God that you love? And do you love his people? Don't you want to associate with the people and the, those that love his word? You want to be more like him, you see. You see, the purpose of the early church is clear. It was to partner with God in fulfilling the Great Commission. And Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4, he said there are two reasons for the church. Make sure your church understands. In fulfilling the Great Commission, you're to make disciples. You see, as you reach them, and you bring them in, and, and you, you teach them to grow up in the faith spiritually, to be spiritually fit. It's a new way of life now. All right, I want to walk in your ways, Lord. I want to join a group. I want to learn, and I want to know what pleases you. I want to walk in your way. I can't do it on myself, you see. And then the second purpose was, he states in Ephesians chapter 4, is to equip the saints to prepare God's people for works of service and to help find their right fit in the grand design of his kingdom and help build up or edify his work in the local assemblies in the body of Christ. I saw this in my parents. They said, oh, you believe in the church or a pastor's wife. But let me tell you, I was raised from a little girl, and I saw my mom and my dad both first become a Christian in a revival service and then get into a local church. And then I saw my mother and my father start taking part and attending faithfully and going to the classes. Then I saw my mother become a teacher. And then I saw my father become a deacon. And then I saw my father, I was a teenager, take us on mission trips. <coughs> And they caught the vision of the body of Christ worldwide in the last 25 years of my parents' life. They sold the boat. They sold the house. And they went to live in Tucson, Arizona and work with life with Bible translators. The kingdom work. They were equipped in the church. You heard me say the first week my father helped build churches. You see. It was my parents that modeled that for me. The local assembly, the benefit of the body of Christ. And I understand the challenge of finding just the right church. You 
you know, I understand that. Just the right fit. There's so many to choose from. Oh, look out here today, right? The right fit, the right one. I've heard comments over the years as women are they're trying out churches. You think they were going shopping for a dress. <laughs> And they say, I finally found a church. I've been sizing them up. And I found one. The congregation, let me tell you, it's not too big. And it's not too small. The congregation is the right size. And the sermon, it's not too long. And it's not too short. Oh, the sermon is just the right length. And the worship is just my style. Not too casual, not too formal, not too loud. <laughs> it's done in the right taste for me. Yep, my new church, it just suits me just fine. But unfortunately, I've heard this. I don't fit in anymore. It just doesn't feel right. I think I'll go window shopping. Anybody here recommend your church? Say somebody's interested in a new church. Anybody recommend yours? Yeah, all right. Just a few of you recommend your church? All right. Stand up and cheer, okay? Now let's look at this church here in Titus chapter 2. It's called the Titus 2 mandate. It's called a mandate because Pastor Paul, the apostle to young Pastor Titus, he said these directives that I'm giving you here are to be taught, uh, they are mandatory for the churchgoers to hear. So he begins in chapter 2 with speaking first, addressing the teacher, who happened to be Pastor Titus, or it applies to all teachers and leaders in the church world, okay? Verse 1, he says, but as for you, you speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine." Now, sound doctrine is essential for right thinking. God's word is the infallible rule for your faith, to what you believe, what you think, what you believe, and what you practice, what you do, all based on sound teaching from God's word. It transforms you from the inside out. You Bible study ladies, all of you here, we realize that God's word is the right kind of material to build our lives upon. So I want to go to a church where it's a healthy church because there's healthy doctrine. T.S. Eliot wrote, church is a place to be renewed, to be transfigured in another, another pattern, contrast to the worldly pattern. Then he says, verse 7, Another word to the leaders, to the teacher. He said, set an example of what you teach, especially you leaders in church, as you know. You know? Verse 7, in all things, show yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine and showing integrity and reverence and incorruptibility. And look at verse 8, with sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. He's saying to the preachers and to you teachers, practice what you teach. <clears throat> Character counts. One more directive he gives the leader, the teacher, the preacher. End of that chapter. Way down in verse 15, here's what he says now to Pastor Titus. Now you speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. He's saying here, all the mandates in between, beginning of the chapter down to the end of the chapter, he says, I've given you now these mandates. I want you to teach. I've appointed you as my representative, and I've given you the authority. I want you to glance through the mandates, and you're going to see that they're tailor-made for each gender. Every churchgoer, Older men represented, the women who are older, the younger women, the young men. And they address the mandate for their lifestyle and their home style and their work style. So important, these mandates, as befitting to each gender, each group, 
they all have the same aim and results. Even though they're different mandates, we're going to go through the, the one to the older and younger women. All of them have the same results, and here's what they are. Look at verse 5. I've underlined it for you, verse 5 and verse 10. When you teach all the groups of the church separately, and the rest are directives, I want you to remind them in verse 5, so that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Because I don't want my people, my body of Christ, to shed Christianity in a negative light. All eyes are on them. This church concept was a new thing in that community. So what kind of witness do you want to be? Do you want to point others to Christ, who is our ultimate role model, or do you want to mislead them? If Christianity doesn't make a difference in a life, then what difference does it make? That's the word of God, made it blasphemed. And then, secondly, in verse 10, he says, Shed Christ in a positive light. Make sure that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Isn't that beautiful? That you make Christianity appealing, attractive by the manner of your living. Wow! Christianity truly is a beautiful thing and I want to experience it. Yes. The Christian life really does make a difference, see, because you adorn it in your life. So he gives him the, all the mandates in between to address the genders of the church. And so I imagine one Sabbath at the pulpit, young Titus speaking, says, I want to continue my sermon series entitled The Right Fit. Two weeks ago, I spoke to the leaders of the church, and you know, last week, specifically the older men here today, and... Today it's Ladies' Day, and I want to dress all those in the Red Hat Society. <laughs> so you see in verse 3, it says, The older women likewise. Likewise, we worked back to the verse before that. See, Titus says, Now remember likewise what I taught the men last week in verse 2? To be sober and reverent and temperate and sound in faith and love and patience. Yes, the older women likewise. Verse 3, that you be reverent too in your behavior as well. So that you too can earn a degree of respect. But then he adds a couple other disciplines here. Not to be slanderers and not given to much wine. But teachers of good things. He's saying restrain from and refrain from here these two things. Restrain. He says, older women now, hold your tongue when the temptation is to engage in gossiping with malicious intent. Guard your tongue, ladies. And refrain from indulging in drinking. Now we know that their water was not sanitary, so they drank wine that was watered down. But it still it says here that too much of it still would cause adverse effects. So, you know, drink it in moderation. So use temperance in moderation in their lives. Now this gives us a little insight into the cultural practices of their day. Imagine the struggles they faced, these women living among the Cretan society. Older women would gather daily, exchanging the latest, setting up grumbling businesses, criticizing, complaining, nitpicking, while sitting. I wonder if this is where we got the term gossiping go sipping. <laughs> Nothing better to do? Nothing better. You do have something better to do, as Pastor Titus said to the women that day preaching. You do. God's not finished with you yet. He says you have a divine purpose. By God's design, you are to be a teacher. Now, we recognize in, in any society that primarily it's the influence of the women who pass on culture and pass on the values. You to be a teacher. Teacher, it's better caught than taught, isn't it? So be a role model, a mentor, a positive influence. Gray hair was a crown of glory in those days. Of course, it still is. With it came prestige and it came authority. Matriarchs taught 
through nurturing and mentoring, formally and informally, but mostly it was homespun. So he's saying here, older women, teach the young women. He's saying, older women, open up your hearts to the younger women. And younger women, you open up your minds because they are wonderful resources in the body of Christ. You see, younger women should do the investigating. And by doing that, you connect the generations. When my husband came to pastor here 12 and a half years ago, Renee, I was 12 and a half years younger. <laughs> yes, there were many elderly women in our congregation. I caught up with them. <laughs> but I recognized many resourceful women with so many stories, so many testimonies that need to be told. So I would meet with them and I'd get their biography, you know, because I wanted to share in our women's meetings. Isn't that a wonderful way in your church to connect the women? Let us hear your stories. And then I'd always ask this at the end with my pencil and paper. I'd say, please tell me, what has it been like to pass through the valleys and the meadows and the mountaintops of life? Tell me about your faith and how it's seen you through. I adopted so many spiritual mothers. The term spiritual mothering came to the forefront in the 1990s in women's ministries. There's a lot of books out about spiritual mothers. It doesn't solely base your qualifications on chronological age to be a spiritual mother. Sometimes life experiences qualify a woman to nurture another in her walk. But the term brought the understanding that women are designed with an innate capacity to nurture. So spiritual mothering, spiritually speaking, as you grow in the Lord, you can show other women what it means to grow up in the faith, to help cultivate her spiritual maturity. You see, in verse 3, in the context of this verse, she is to be a spiritual mother who happens to be an older woman. She's admonished to train the younger women by teaching or cultivating what is good. What does your life say? It's very telling, isn't it? Here are the virtues you are to model and encourage and nurture that are consistent with the truth of God's word, and you are to model the older women to the younger women. This is called biblical womanhood. Verse 4. Now verse 4 and the end of the verse 5 end and begin with loving your husbands and being obedient to them. We'll put them together. He's saying the older women you model, you exemplify to the younger women what it means to love and to obey. The word love in this Greek term goes deeper than human emotion. It's that of friendship and enjoyment. He's not the old man. He should be your best friend. It's obvious by the way you speak to him and speak about him and the way you care for him and you care about him. I've been inspired living here with the many snowbirds that come in and out each year. You leave your spacious homes up north and you stay here for many months and there's a lot of days and nights you live together in close quarters. <laughs> Long days. <laughs> but you know what? You model to our younger couples that growing older together is something to look forward to. Now, in the mandate to love their husband, it's to obey, all right? We still say that in our wedding vows. Okay. doesn't mean subservient, like it does in some cultures. I found this story funny. Barbara Waters did a story on gender roles in Afghanistan. Several years before the Afghan conflict, she noted that women customarily walked five paces behind their husbands. Years later, she went back to Kabul and observed that women still walk behind their husbands despite this overthrow of the oppressive regime. In fact, women now seem to walk even further behind their husbands, and they seem even happier. 
hear about it. <laughs> so she approached one of the Afghan women and she asked, why do you now seem happy with an old custom that you once tried so desperately to change? The woman looked Miss Walters straight in the eyes and without hesitation she said, land mines. <laughs> us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, 
we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. Saying, take up God's standard. Avoid compromising to the fads and the fashions of this world, those that are immodest. Keep in mind when you go shopping, like Renee, you were a good girl. <laughs> you were looking really good, right? <laughs> to be chased. And now, when it comes to your home, proudly let them in. <laughs> be a homemaker, he's saying. That's how you exemplify the Christian life in your lifestyle, in your home style. A woman's ministry is not limited to her home, but that's where it begins. You know, the trend has kind of turned, I think, in recent years. You know, we ask a little girl, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she says, well, I want to be the new Food Network star. <laughs> I want to be design star. I want to host HGTV. You see, the home, it's a beautiful place. In their day, women were neglecting their homes, even disdaining the routineness of making a house a home, being a homemaker. Maintaining a home is not easily done, is it? Now we know women usually oversee this operation, that it gets done, however it may get done, but we usually are the ones who oversee it. Why? Because it's my nest. You see, I want to make sure. So he's saying to be proud of your house, to be a homemaker. This came to my mind last summer. Esther and Wanda and I, we helped an elderly lady. She was 96 years old. Her name's Jessie Kissel. She passed away recently. And we helped her move into an assistant living facility, and it wasn't an apartment. It was only half of a room. Her new address was what? 134A. Still, her Space was a reflection of who she was, her favorite color, her pictures in place, a display of her knickknacks, a comfortable chair and a bed, and a closet that was neat and neat drawers. That was it. That was her space to beautify and organize and create, to express herself in her corner of the world. She may have changed houses. She never changed homes. She was a homemaker. Be a homemaker. And lastly, the directive to women is this. Demonstrate goodness and kindness. Doing good deeds. That was a foreign concept in their society there. Imagine the impact on Christianity as a movement of a small band of Christian women began to perform a multitude of little deeds of kindness in their everyday life, with no strings attached. One lady in particular was Tabitha. Her story is recorded in the book of Acts, the history of the early New Testament church, chapter 9 of the book of Acts. And here's how it begins. In verse 36, it says that in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is... Dorcas, who always was doing good and helping the poor. You've heard of the Dorcas Society, named after her. Now it's interesting that her name was uh, Tabitha, but they translated or nicknamed her Dorcas, and the name, it meant gazelle. That's what they call her. Her name was Tabitha, but she's a gazelle, or, or Dorcas. That was a nickname. She was a gazelle. But today we say, hey, she's an energizer bunny. But back then, she was a gazelle. I like that name, gazelle. Yeah. I like it because this is how it's described. A gazelle is a small, swift antelope with soft, bright eyes, noted for her graceful movement. So Tabitha had a reputation in the community. Hey, you need a robe? Go see that Christian woman. She'll whip you up one in no time. She gives her time freely, and she doesn't charge a thing. She's a deer. Isn't that wonderful? Dorcas lived in the seaside town of Joppa. She was known first as a disciple who was a seamstress. She was a sincere follower of Jesus Christ, who had the reputation of always doing good. 
And she was a woman of means, and she was generous, and she shared her wealth and her time and her talents with each task. She saw it as, she saw it as an opportunity to touch women, women, each one by one. I bet it made her feel good, made them feel good. As she said to them, she was there probably tending the coach, hey, do you realize how special you are to God? Hey, you know you're a designer original. Can you imagine her with a caring heart, touching each one by one? Hey, how's your grandson doing? Tell me, I've been praying for him. You see, she had a ministry. You know, the sewing groups that met in churches started out years ago, the sewing circles. They met in circles mm -hmm. so they could talk, so they could share. You see, there was a ministry in that special interest group. So Dorcas was a channel of God's love. Mother Teresa, who organized the Sisters of Charity in the streets of Calcutta, said this, we can do no great thing, only small things with great love. Now, as the story continues, Renee, would you read the rest of the story, verse 37 to 42? Listen, Dorcas dies. She died doing good. Well, and that's the way to go. Yeah, listen to this. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him, and they urged him, Please, come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying, and showing him the robes and the other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her alive to them. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Can you imagine the scene when Peter arrived there? In the upper room, the women, her sisters in Christ, the believers from her little local assembly, and the poor, disadvantaged widows were there. They were all surrounding her lifeless body. And they were clutching the clothes that she had made for them. Some of you may recall a couple of years when Esther brought Jesse Kizzle here. She was 94 at the time before she moved into 134A. And she loved to sew. She was a seamstress. Really, she was a self-made seamstress since a little girl. She loved to sew. But that next year then, after she was, when she was 95, she had to give it up because her eyes were failing her. She loved making clothes for others and altering them for her friends. And so when her eyes failed her, she said to me one day, well, I can't sew anymore, but I can still knit. I can do that blindfolded. Mm -hmm. You know that next fall when we moved her over to that assistant living? That's what Jessie did. She'd sit in her little corner of the world in her little corner chair, and, and she would knit. A month before she died, I remember visiting her, and she said to me, I don't think. I can knit anymore. She says, my right hand feels weak. She passed away within a few weeks. And as Esther and I went the next day to help vacate her belongings, I found this in the drawer, in the bag, with one of her rings. But at the end of it was this. can't knit anymore. She did all she could, as long as she could. I clutched it. Our precious Jesse. What an example.
do all you can for all you can. Isn't that a way to die? Doing all you can for as long as you can. So Peter, when he went up and the ladies were there, he said, you got to get out of the room. He knelt and he prayed and then in faith he spoke out, Tabitha, get up. And she immediately wakened and she sat up and then he helped her to her feet. Well, the blood had to start circulating again. Slowly, get up. Then he presented her to the women. Can you imagine that scene? Can you imagine? And then the word spread quickly, and as a result of this miracle, many people in that town became believers. You talk about the promise of Romans 8.28, that everything fits into a pattern for good to those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. This was for her good. This was for their good. And this was for the good of the community and for God's good. But nothing more is said about Tabitha. What do you think she did? I think she picked up right where she left off. Don't you think? That's what Jesse would have done. She lived her life on purpose, all for the glory of God, and she found fulfillment in doing so. What a way to live life. You see? This woman reaped as she sowed. All along, her life was fulfilled. Why? Because she reaped as she sowed. How is that? She was enriched as she enriched others. She reaped benefits as she was benefiting others. I was thinking, how was she benefited when she was sowing? Her skills were probably sharpened, right? And she was learning how to cut corners, and she was just doing it better and better. Possibly there were some other believers who were coming and saying, hey, I want to do what you're doing. I have an interest in that. Would you train me? Because I want to do it too. She benefited as they benefited. Possibly she made lots of girlfriends along the way. She was a spiritual mother to many. You see, and this opportunity the Lord had given her. And there is the multiplication of ministry in spiritual mothering. I wonder how many of those disadvantaged women became believers. That they were benefited as she was benefited. But this is, I believe, is her greatest reward. As she made herself available, she reaped as she sowed with her abilities and her resources and her time and her energy. This is what happened. She stepped into history. In his story, fitting into his plan, be fitting as a woman with purpose to help accomplish the kingdom of God and fulfill the great commission. She reaped as she sowed. Everything I have belongs to God. All that I am. I give to God to be used by him to accomplish his will in my life and in the life of others. You see? And then I close with these two verses. Verse 11 and 12 applies to all children of God. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. He's saying this. Do you understand you are a work in progress. Do you understand that salvation has appeared to all of us? That salvation is just the beginning of the work in your life? Thank God for his grace to save me. You see, that's what this discipling is all about. I'm not comfortable living in the old pattern anymore. I see, God, I need to make some alterations in my life so I can grow to be spiritually fit. Because he who began a good work in me will perform it until the day of Christ. Salvation is the good work that he does in us when we trust his son. But that's just the beginning. God continues to work in us through his Holy Spirit. The work God does for us is salvation. The work God does in us is sanctification, cleansing us daily. 
And the work God does through us is service. And this work will continue until we see Christ. And then the work will be completed. Lord, I want to reap as I sow, pleasing unto you as your disciple. It's my desire to think Christianly and to act Christianly. Lord, give me your supernatural grace to help me say no to ungodliness and worldly lust. Lord, I want to be spiritually fit, pleasing unto you. Because I know this. As I sow a thought, I reap an act. Lord, I want to be pleasing unto you. And as I sow an act, I reap a habit. Lord, I will be pleasing unto you. And as I sow a habit, I reap a character. Lord, I want to be pleasing unto you. Lord, I want to honor you with my lifestyle and my home style and my work style as befitting to a Christian woman. And as I sow a character, I reap a destiny. Our ultimate destiny. Destination. The last verse 13 as we are looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, purify me. Because I want to stand one day before you, face to face, as your bride, clothed in your righteousness and in the beauty of holiness. Lord, I want to stand before you one day, but Lord, I want to be outstanding. I live for you with all of my heart and with all of my life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your word to guide us, we can stand on, to direct us. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us, your women, who love your word. Lord Jesus, we want to glorify you with our lives, in our communities, and in our homes, in all these ways, in our manner of life, as befitting as your children, your daughters of the King. Father, this morning, as the searchlight is turned on, Father, is there anything in my heart that I see as is displeasing to you? Father, I ask you to, from this day forward, by the power and the strength and the grace of your Holy Spirit, help me. Help me, dear Lord, from this day forth. Lord, this morning, you know there's something I've been wanting to do in your kingdom, and I've just been kind of holding back. And Father, I pray that this week, give me that holy boldness to step forward and say, yes. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to fit into your plan in this end time harvest. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you hear us. Thank you, Lord, that you see us. Go with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.